All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started now. Um, welcome today to today's session on future proofing your IoT deployments for 5G networks. I am Ariella Ross, Marketing Manager at Friendly Technologies, the IoT and device management company. Uh, today, we are joined by technologist Sean Vandervault, who is an IoT expert and our presenter for today. So without further ado, Sean, you want to go ahead and take over? Great. Thank you, Ariella. Good day. Good morning to everyone in um, Europe, the Middle East and Africa. I believe we have a number of uh, uh, attendees today from the region. Thank you very much. Um, so without a further ado, what we'll do is um, start the presentation. Um, the plan for the presentation is I'm going to go through a couple of slides and then I have a very quick demo at the end of this to just um, illustrate some of the points that I've been talking about. Um, so today we're going to be covering future proofing your IoT device deployments. And um, you know, we're really presenting the case for these improvements here. Uh, service providers have been investing quite heavily uh, moving from 3G to 4G uh, in the past, and that investment involved um, supporting low power WAN. Uh, topologies such as NB-IoT and LTEM and each of the different regions you know whether it's Americas, Europe, uh, Asia, uh, APAC um, uh, use NB-IoT or LTEM or both depending on the particular target territory. So there obviously have been a deployment of IoT devices using these topologies to date and so the concern now is with your fleet of devices and with the service providers support of those devices what's what's going to be happening moving towards 5G and um, the standards body 3GPP and the ITU have defined this uh, 5G NR specifications uh, I think post release 16 um, and so with that with that uh, five, the deployment of 5G networks at uh, operators around the globe uh, what's going to be happening with those older NB-IoT CAT-M1 uh, or LTE-M uh, IoT devices. So uh, the following kind of requirements arise when you start looking at what's going to happen moving towards 5G. Um, you know, will I be able to support a large number of devices with the uh, high connection densities? You know, we're looking at, or, you know, billions of devices depending on the particular use cases and uh, you know if that's spread over quite a big geographical region will the uh, 5G networks be able to cater for that and um, in addition will your NB-IoT or LTEM uh, device deployments uh, support that as well. So the next is uh, looking at sort of low cost um, or the continuance of low cost because if you don't want to go and put more expensive 5G uh, chipsets or modules and have to swap 4G uh, LTE to, to 5G uh, chipsets. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a very cost sensitive area. And uh, when we start looking at those very uh, high volume resource constraint devices with low footprint, you know, a very low amount of RAM, CPU flash, and um, a, a low chipset count, you don't really want to be driving that price point up moving to 5G. The others are uh, looking at ultra long uh, battery life. So looking at, you know, smart meters being able to be operational in excess of, you know, 12, 15, even up to 20 years. Uh, and how is that going to be handled in the 5G environment with, uh, you know, the new standards. Um, looking at also coverage in harsh environments, uh, since 5G brings in, you know, uh, higher throughputs on the depending on which categories you're looking at, um, and you and and thus using higher frequency spectrum, uh, you know, that has an impact on range and penetration. Um, so that's another consideration for uh, your uh, spectrum being used currently on LTE networks. And the last, last kind of major consideration here is uh, that, that spectrum. So how 
will my NB-IoT LTEM um, fit into the new 5G NR um, schema? Right, um, the good news is uh, the standards body have uh, obviously forethought this and there have been modifications made to the standards uh, for 5G NR to ensure that LTEM and NB-IoT uh, spectrum is catered for within the new uh, spectrum scheme. And so that means that there is a natural future proofing of your current uh, NB-IoT or LTEM supported IoT devices uh, running off the current LTE or 4G networks will be uh, operational or at least uh, be uh, operational on the new 5G NR deployment. So uh, essentially that means um, uh, that uh, the standards are incorporated into the new 5G NR. Um, and just so that we're clear, when we talk about low power WAN uh, and NBIT LTEM, we're referring to the categories NB1, category NB2 for NB-IoT, and uh, category M1 and category M2 for LTEM. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, I'm sure a few of you or a number of you have uh, looked at these sort of um, figures before, but uh, this just gives you an illustration of some of the main important categories within LTEM and NB-IoT, and the ones we kind of considering here are uh, CAT M1, CAT M2, you know, the higher throughputs on the M2, and as well as um, uh, with 3GPP release 14, bringing in CAT uh, NB1, or oh, MB2, apologies, uh, bringing in a few additional features and higher throughput. So really opening up, um, you know, more use cases uh, for those sort of low footprint um, uh, devices and being able to support higher throughput as well. Um, and I think in the, in the Europe uh, environment, they're, you know, they've been using the, uh, the GSM standard and uh, there, there are obviously a number of NB IoT uh, deployments um, happening in, in Europe in some of the target territories, which is um, a, a good thing. Okay. So um, when we start looking at protocols, um, in the future proofing arena, there are a few protocols that stand out. Um, I'm not going to go and read um, and, 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 and go through too many of these points. I'm going to give you a high-level summary. Uh, but essentially, uh, the main protocols we're looking at um, is uh, we talk about structured device management protocols and unstructured uh, management protocols. So a structured structured management protocol is uh, the examples are lightweight M2M and USP. Those are defined by a standards body. Um, each one in that case has its own. Um, and they have well-defined uh, 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 parameterization and well-defined processes for things like parameter updates, things like um, uh, uh, pushing firmware over the air updates, uh, even software software or container applications over the air. So there is um, very good definitions for all of that within those two protocols. Um, and I, I guess one of the standouts would be the firmware upgrade or firmware over the air um, is very well supported in those standards. Um, so as far as functions are concerned, uh, we're also looking at the kind of standard ubiquitous IoT protocol, uh, uh, one of them being MQTT. Um, uh, MQTT bring, uh, com uh, comes with a set of challenges on, uh, on its own, uh, but it is a very easy protocol uh, to work with since um, its publish subscribe schema works quite well in disseminating telemetry data. Um, but it, again, although it, it does uh, is catered for by a standards body, um, it is not a device management standard. So what that means is the topic structure for MQDT is not well defined for parameterization, firmware of the upgrades, um, and these sorts of device management functions and features that we have. Um, 
they have to be custom defined and uh, custom implemented in a management system or backend system to be able to cater for that device. So that means there could be a, a variety, variety of different manufacturers supplying MQTT protocols for their different types of devices, and they will all be potentially implemented in uh, different topic structures, and it makes that a little bit more complex to handle. Um, and COAP uh, is uh, sort of a real stripped down, um, uh, unstructured protocol being an application protocol. It uh, is used by IoT edge devices. Um, it is a very, very low footprint type uh, protocol, but uh, again, uh, any of the uh, data payloads or parameterization or firmware updates and so forth is all custom defined and uh, as such presents um, some issues around integrating that. But from a future proofing point of view, you can clearly see if you start standardizing on, on device management standards, which are well defined, there's a lot of interoperability between edge devices and management systems. Um, so uh, when we look at some of the features there, again, I don't want, really want to go into great detail, I'll give you a couple of highlighted points here. Uh, if we look at Lightweight M2M and even USP, uh, the two are, let's say, fairly equivalent in terms of its functions and features. Um, there are some standouts. So Lightweight M2M caters for, in addition to IP-based protocols, also non-IP protocols, and uh, we'll cover a little bit of uh, the NIDD, so uh, the non-IP data delivery type uh, device, edge device, and we'll, we'll cover some of that. But for Lightweight M2M, uh, it is a very, very well thought through, well-defined device management protocol for re resource constraint IoT devices. And including, you know, a, a defined payload, um, is sort of a, a payload uh, mechanisms like a CBOR, OPAC, TLV and JSON. So different types of payloads can be defined and can be very, very optimized, such as using a CBOR or even OPAC. Um, and also supporting a, a good set of security uh, schemas from edge device through the, the network uh, up to application objects. Uh, so the example is OSCOR uh, support in Lightweight M2M. And supporting the full ambit of all the device management functions, including most importantly with Lightweight M2M is uh, the data orchestration components so that we call it observe and notify so that's where you're able to actually uh, uh, advise or, or configure a, a, a set of edge devices in terms of what telemetry data you would like to consume from those devices um, and the criteria for that such as the update rates or potentially uh, out of bounds values or uh, delta value changes or so forth that those updates happen then autonomously um, and as far as USP is concerned, it's uh, quite a new standard. Um, so from a date point of view, Lightweight M2M was defined in uh, February 2017 for, uh, for more than four years ago uh, as version 1.0. Um, and we're up at version 1.2 has been ratified uh, as of today. Uh, USP is a, a fairly new uh, defined updated protocol from the old broadband TR-069, it's now become TR-369, but with USP. And um, in this case, they're again, very well-defined um, structures to handle the, uh, you know, kind of parameterization updates, firmware of the updates, uh, doing, you know, bulk uh, st statistics and telemetry and uh, bulk collection of data from edge devices. So. Uh, and, and, and cloud ready, right? So, I mean, yeah, we're talking about internet cloud integration capabilities. So you can see WebSockets and Stomp uh, as defined application layer protocol. So there's a lot of uh, um, forethought brought into the new USP um, standard. Uh, MQTT, as we're aware, TCP based, uh, connection orientated, and MQTT does present issues on low power devices if the device is going into battery save or sleep uh, you know your connection sockets are breaking down and it means extra overhead in the applications to re-establish sockets 
and it's just it's wasteful there's a lot of overhead um, and uh, and so forth um, uh, with co-app uh, it's obviously very streamlined but again uh, the custom def definitions for the payloads um, uh, there is some you know obviously supporting TLS but it's you know it's, it's probably not as optimized as like with M2M when we're talking about that um, and yeah so a, a big kind of con there would be that end-to-end -end proprietary you know you, you you have to define the edge devices payloads and parameters and you know any workflow like firmware updates and you have to really go and implement that in the management server again so and that also counts for the management server having to try and uh, work with uh, the uh, those types of different devices it does present quite a big, big challenge now uh, as far as performance is concerned uh, our device management protocol so lightweight n2m is designed for very low footprints so those battery operated resource constraint type devices uh, you can see in terms of bandwidth utilization it is very low it is in in some studies um, it is it's measured to be 88 percent more efficient than mqtt um, so you know 88 percent more efficient that's a huge amount when you're talking about uh, you know having to traverse data over a very narrow uh, NBIoT type of data channel um, and it just makes it much more efficient but um, obviously like with M2M being scalable uh, being able to provide high availability on the uh, on the management server side and uh, as far as the edge device and the management server is concerned but for the edge it's a fairly low investment because there are off there are off the shelf um, SDKs and clients available for Lightweight M two M since it's been in um, in operation for a number of years now already. Um, so similar similar for USP except USP I would kind of more target and gear towards gateways and more complex ap applications. Maybe they generally could be powered, but it could be un, uh, you know battery operated, but generally power type gateway applications where uh, USP then quite excels in terms of that integration uh, into the, the IT and, and, and to the cloud domain. Uh, but again, having being able to have multiple servers, high scalability, high availability, um, and there are some developments at present to uh, provide a open source USP clients and those will be are available of some of the standards bodies and in this case being the broadband forum um, now from an mqt point of view yes uh, typically a medium type footprint device you, you do see them on a low footprint iot device but again depending on the communication channel if we're talking nb iot uh, it does present problems using mqtt so yeah we're really looking at uh, those kind of uh, medium footprint uh, type devices maybe always powered devices um so you know more bandwidth more power consumption um and it's it's a publish subscribe uh protocol so it, with these topics so you publish and subscribe on topics and so it's, it's quite an easy protocol to work with um so that's quite a big benefit for it and probably one of the reasons why it's quite widely used today but again the, no, no defined device management uh, structures there and, and that presents always a bit of a challenge okay co-op um, as you can see um, very low footprint low power consumption um, but you know from an investment point of view it's it we perceive it as a higher investment because you have to go and go and custom define all those data models for your your devices you have to really go and reinvent the wheel and that makes uh, a, a bit of a steeper uh, investment curve there on uh, trying to implement co-op in in an end-to-end solution okay when we start looking at those devices now how do these things actually connect so there's usually a couple of different uh, connection schemes uh, so from a management server you can go through a cloud environment uh, through the access network and so now luckily 5g in our supporting uh the you know the mbrt ltm uh, uh devices and that means we can 
connect through any of those access networks. But so you can go through a cloud API type integration with devices. Typically, those are like devices you may get from Amazon or you know uh, 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 like Google devices, Nest, and so forth. So um, and and so one can do those sorts of API integrations, but not that interesting. More interesting is those uh, connected uh, IoT sensors. So they're either IP connected. So with the ATC, uh, UDP or well, TCP UDP stack on the edge device. In Lightroom and term, we don't need to use TCP, so we can have uh, UDP, but uh, IP nonetheless, and depending on the type of protocol. Um, and, and there's also the possibility of using non-IP for NDIT and L LTEM. Um, and I'll go through that, that um, in the in next slide. Um, the other options are, you know, you may have some uh, you know, on-site uh, gateway uh, with a particular type of RF connection. It may be like, a, a, you know, a, a 900 meg or telemetry or 400, and, uh, 400 meg uh, telemetry type link uh, connecting to a bunch of IoT sensors. And in that case, um, you know, a good option there potentially is using USP um, in the gateway uh, and uh, then the, the uh, the gateway actually performs the USB translation back to the edge device via the RF network. And last but not least on that connection scheme is the LoRaWAN type gateway. That's just one example, but uh, generally uh, there's be an IP connection to it. Um, and uh, so using any of the, the, the sort of management protocols, so that's one one option. The other is uh, Lightweight M2M version 1.1 brings in a non-IP management uh, functions to LoRaWAN uh, devices. So we're quite looking forward to those sorts of projects uh, coming up uh, now. Um, but yeah, that's another whole topic to be talking about. Um, so from a device management server point of view, of course, um, you know, uh, the data that is being ingested, um, so we call that managing that data through a data orchestration, the data orchestration in the device management platform basically chooses what devices, what uh, parameter, what, what sort of uh, resources, what parameters are need to be monitored, and that is then uh, can be pushed up into big data big data data lakes, uh, could be analytics platforms, cloud environments, or uh, you know uh, upstream applications. So and that's typically how this um, would be all put together. And um, so from a management device management point of view, you could have, as it shows, administrator, technician, or end users in a multi-tenanted device management platform. And it could be a software as a service or a cloud-hosted uh, uh, service as well. OK, um, so from a particular device point of view, we were talking about those uh, constraint devices. So uh, when we talk about lightweight M2M in this edge device, this is typically what the protocol stack looks like. Um, and so the future proofing here, there's a couple of interesting bindings. So the standard uh, Lightweight M2M uh, from version 1.0 is Lightweight M2M, CoAP, DTLS, UDP, or SMS bindings. Um, and with version 1.1 and then the update on version 1.2 brought in some of these additional bindings. So you can run what we call cellular IoT. So essentially, uh, this provides for um, uh, and you can see the binding cellular IoT on the right. This provides for the non-IP data delivery uh, from uh, application server to the UE at the edge, and uh, we'll, we'll go through that shortly. But it's also providing bindings for LoRaWAN, and you, so you can use TCP with TLS if you really wanted to, and there's a few other options there. So it's um, very well, uh, uh, defined, it's there, there's, there's a lot of support for it now, um, and there's a lot of uh, vendor ma manufacturers adopting Lightweight like M2M into the, the products. Um, and I think security is quite a big important one. If you start looking at applications like metering, um, you know, you want to make sure that there's revenue grade security built in, and uh, so the DTLS or TLS in this case, depending on which bindings you're using, uh, secures device to a, a, a server, and OSCOR gives you uh, the object application security as well. Um, so there is multiple levels of security built in 
You, we may look at an MQTT device, something like this. As I said, it could be battery operated, but potentially a powered device. Uh, so, of course, MQTT uh, version 3 um, using TCP. So, this is typically the protocol stack, uh, either IP4, uh, V4, or IPv6. But, um, of course, you could, could use uh, MQTT SN for sensor networks. It, that does operate over a UDP protocol um, and maybe a little bit more optimized than uh, using MQTT with TCP. But uh, still, uh, you have all those issues around those published subscribe topics and having to define all of the management structures for that. Um, so that's typically what that would look like. Uh, USP, as I was mentioning, uh, well defined for, for these more complex gateway applications. And in addition to all the good features around uh, parameterization updates, monitoring control, uh, firmware updates, and so forth, there's also the abilities to push container applications to edge gateways. Um, and, and as I said, you know, this uh, internet cloud-based integration capabilities, uh, which Lightroom like M2M has um, as well, but that comes in from an application server point of view. However, however uh, the USP protocol now caters for a lot of that native uh, integration. Okay, uh, one of the ways uh, we've looked at uh, doing a gateway integration, uh, we've used, for example, the MQTT client in the dev device, and we've had, uh, you know, Zigbee, Z-Wave, Z-Wave uh, sensors. Uh, so typically, this is used in our smart home uh, platform, and um, so the uh, MQT, Zigbee, Z-Wave type client built into the gateway caters for the translation of all the parameterization. So we've built in the data structures for uh, doing uh, device updates, uh, being able to collect sensor information, being able to control uh, actuators on the edge of the Zigbee network. Um, so that is uh, a all in complete <laughs> and integrated end-to-end -end, um, solution that we have already implemented. All right, just talking about some of the clouds. Um, so what, this is a screen I generally um, kind of uh, explain what our integration at a carrier network would look like. And so within a carrier network deployment, you'll have a device management platform. Uh, one of the beauties of this is that we're treated as a, uh, with a, as a central device registry. So that means an operator doesn't need to have a myriad of management platforms for different IoT verticals, like one for uh, telematics tracking and another one for smart cities and another one for you know uh, uh, metering. Um, so when you're using the management standards like Lightweight M2M and USP, and you're using um, this device management platform, you can uh, 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 bring on board any of your uh, devices in the field. So you've got a single uh, asset registry, you've got a single point of contact to do complete end-to-end -end life cycle management on that device. Uh, from provisioning all the way to deprovisioning to firmware updates and any uh, configuration and so forth updates in between. Um, you, you'll notice uh, uh, in this diagram there's an RDBMS database, that's the device management uh, data, so all the you know kind of parameter updates, and then there's a real-time database, and that's the time series database. That's the store for all the monitor data, telemetry data coming in from all those edge devices. And there's a number of ways of getting this up into upstream applications, and I'll give you a quick view of that shortly. Um, so uh, uh, apologies, I needed to mention. Um, so when we are talking about 5G NR. Uh, you will see uh, operators deploying a SCEF uh, element in their network, and that SCEF element allows us to onboard non-IP uh, edge devices. So there are there's a mode in NBIoT and LTEM for the modules <coughs> to work in a non-IP uh, fashion. Uh, give me one second. Um, right. So in a non-IP fashion. Um, uh, what we do is uh, we we have integrated with a number of the uh, equipment vendors providing SCEF, <coughs> excuse me, and we do that through that T8 API as, as indicated on the diagram. Um, and uh, so to illustrate that in a little bit more detail, the 
uh, 3GPP and the Lightweight M2M standards uh, talk about this integration at great length. And um, so this has already been uh, integrated. So when we look at a Lightweight M2M protocol stack in the UE, the edge device at, on the left here, um, you will see their data paths, whether you're using SMS bindings or the IP, uh, or if you're using non-IP um, through SCEF. And those are the uh, various mechanisms of getting to uh, these uh, types of NDIT or L uh, CAT -M, uh, well, LTE M devices um, at the edge. On the right, it's giving you a bit of an interface diagram. And what we do with our Lightweight like M2M server is we use that T8 API for uh, MT and MO. Uh, and also for trigger, triggering any uh, device wake-ups and so forth. But um, that non-IP interface comes in through that T8 API. And once uh, we do that uh, T8 API, well, when we with the T8 A A API integration, it means we can then also register the device on the central device registry, and we can perform uh, certain actions on that device as well. Uh, one of the big... Um, integrations that, um, that, that's been done uh, is we've actually integrated our uh, one IoT engine. Uh, so this is a device management engine um, and we pr provided a protocol bridge for the Azure IoT environment. Now, why would that be needed? Um, Azure IoT already caters for things like MQT, MQTT and you know, AMQP and, and a few specific protocol, but that Azure IoT don't cater for Lightweight M2M, they don't cater for OMADM, USP, TRO69, and so forth, and some, some of the other custom protocols. So what our bridge uh, interface does is it actually provides a central device registry again, and uh, when any device is registered on our platform, a, a device twin is automatically created dynamically, as well as a device template. So the device twin will be the digital copy of the uh, physical device in the field. And so any updates or even firmware updates uh, on, on the device will be uh, uh, actioned on that physical device twin. And the device template is provided uh, dynamically in IoT Central so that uh, when you develop a dashboard IoT application in IoT Central, it is, uh, you, you have all the interface uh, um, uh, options to be able to control or update your, your device twin and consequently and dynamically synchronously the physical device is updated at the edge. This is something we have uh, finished released in November 2020 uh, so last year and um, this is a very exciting development but the same thing uh, the similar concept uh, could be done with uh, uh, Amazon and Google and, and, and other clouds as well. And you'd ask why is this important? Well, uh, if you have IoT enterprise applications you're developing in Azure, uh, you may want to actually develop your IoT dashboard applications in Azure IoT Central. And by doing this, you get full end-to-end -end integration for all your device uh, uh, fleets. Okay. There are other ways uh, without performing uh, all those IoT device twin, uh, you know, it, it has certain features and, and, and functions, but if you just want to do data ingestion and do uh, data analytics and you want to do specific applications in your enterprise application, there are various ingestion options here. You could uh, utilize a REST API or uh, any of the stream queues, uh, such as uh, we already do uh, Kafka, and AMQP uh, protocol streams up into cloud, and so so we so uh, the same with PubSub and uh, any of the other uh, kind of main standard uh, stream queues. So those stream queues allow uh, the, the the various different cloud environments to ingest that data directly into the cloud environment, um, and that's a we have a multi-tenanted uh, approach to that in the management system. So that means a sub-tenant or a lower level tenant can actually set up their own connection strings. And that accounts for the Azure IoT as well as these uh, Azure upstream cloud um, interfaces. Okay, so quickly I want to get to a conclusion. 
and it'll give you a quick uh, view of what this looks like with different protocols uh, pushing data and, and uh, displaying that. So uh, from a conclusion point of view, um, really, you, you, so moving into the future and uh, being able to support IoT, these NBIT and LTEM devices in these 5G and our networks, you want to really try and focus on these standards-based management protocols. So where as far as possible uh, you're defining devices or getting uh, manufacturers to develop devices, uh, they generally would try to take the easy route, but uh, as in just reuse MQTT that they may have had in something else. But if you're uh, following a standards-based approach with likelihood term or USP, uh, it provides for um, you know all those benefits we were talking about earlier. Um, you also um, using uh, these optimized management protocols like likelihood term, you get much lower power utilization, uh, so that really helps to uh, you know, keep your devices going for a longer period of time, even on the 5G NR networks. Efficient over the air transmissions, um, so both management data and telemetry data, uh, interoperability between devices and management servers, built-in security mechanisms from transport protocols uh, for data protection and application layer security, so that's quite an important one to focus on. Some of those, like the co-apps and the, you know, MQTTs and so forth, generally won't have some of the more advanced security mechanisms that uh, like to uh USP has. Um, and so, of course, a big uh, one is there's um, uh, adoption by some of the uh, bigger carriers and, and customers around the world. Uh, this is a very short list, but um, you know, you have tier ones adopting Lightweight M2M um, in, in the deployments of their IoT uh, applications.